There are many situations where you would want to use springs in the system you're designing. The reason can be as easy as wanting flexibility of parts to a degree that would otherwise make the parts deform plastically, to more sophisticated ones like storing energy, being able to move components and have them return without additional automation, or even aiding cyclic loading with little input energy. Depending on the shape and type of spring, like conical versus cylindrical for wire springs, or extension versus compression versus torsional for either helical or flat springs, their flexibility can be linear or nonlinear. This means that you can have a spring force that is proportional to the compression or elongation of the spring, or even constant regardless of its deformation. In today's video, we will look at the stresses in helical compression springs, bases which we will still apply to extension springs directly, and even conical springs equation derivations. We will also look at their deflection and develop an expression for the spring rate, or in other words, an equation that allows us to calculate the spring constant k from material properties and dimensional parameters. If we look at a spring made with a wire of diameter lowercase d, and we define that the spring diameter, or mean coil diameter capital D, goes from the center of the wire from one side to the other, we can define two dimensions that will be important later on. The outer diameter will be equal to capital D plus a radius on the left and another radius on the right, which is the same as one wire diameter, lowercase d. In the same way, the inner diameter will be equal to capital D minus a radius on each side, or D minus D. If we do a cut anywhere along the wire of a spring that is subjected to a compression force F, a quick free body diagram would reveal that the cut is subjected to a reaction force and a torque. A sum of forces in the y direction shows that the reaction force is equal to F, and the sum of moments about the cross section shows that the torque, not moment since its direction is not coplanar to the cross section, is equal to FD over 2. And again, this is true for anywhere you decide to perform the cut of the wire that makes up the spring. This shows us that any cross-section area along the wire is subjected to two external loads that will cause shearing stresses, a shear force that causes pure shear or direct shear, and a torque that causes torsion. The radius would be that of the wire, so it's lowercase d over 2, and it affects not only the radius variable, but j, the polar second moment of area we had studied before, link below, and the area a. Substituting the torque and the other variables, we find that the shearing stress is equal to 8fd over pi d cubed plus 4f over pi d squared. If we define the spring index, which we will use extensively and is a measure of coil curvature as capital D over lowercase d, we can simplify the shearing stress equation by factoring out a 2c plus 1 over 2c term that we'll call k sub s, the shear stress correction factor. For design purposes, it is recommended to use spring index values between 4 and 12. Springs with indices lower than 4 will be more difficult to form because during the bending of the wire, the outer surface might crack, and spring indices higher than 12 will require individual spring packaging for them not to tangle with each other. This will be an important design restriction later. This stress equation is assuming a straight wire that is subjected to pure shearing and torsion. However, because of its shape, we cannot assume that the coil will behave as a straight wire. If we measure the inside length of the wire, we would have several circumferences using the inner diameter d minus d. The number of circumferences would be the number of coils in the spring n. If we now measure the length on the other side of the wire, meaning along the outer side of the spring, we would have a length of n circumferences using an outer diameter d plus d. If we were to straighten this wire, we would see that one side is way longer than the other. Because accounting for this as a straight wire would not be straightforward, we use a k factor that corrects for both curvature as well as the direct shear term. There are several correction factors to choose from, but since the difference between them are in the order of 1%, we'll use the KB factor 4C plus 2 over 4C minus 3. We will see that this stress is not directly compared to the yield strength, but to the torsional yield strength. Presets are often used in springs, which means that the spring is purposely deformed past its yield point to maintain a permanent deformation that will counter the operation loads. But more on that later. The torsional yield strength will be a function of the ultimate tensile strength, which in turn is a function of wire diameter and material, but again, more on that later. Moving on to the deflection analysis of helical springs, we start by looking at the strain energy within the spring when it's being deformed. 
Since there exists a direct shear force F and a torque T affecting any and every circular element that forms the wire, the strain energy will be that of torsion and direct shear, two of the five types we talked about several videos ago, link below. Substituting variables like T, J, and A, and knowing that the length of the wire is equal to the number N of circumferences, where N is the number of coils, we find an expression for the total strain energy in the spring. Using Castigliano's theorem, covered in the same video mentioned above and one of the links below, we can find the total deflection y as the partial derivative of the energy with respect to the force f. The derivative of both terms will give us a 2 times f times the other variables. Factoring out the entire first term and remembering that the spring index c is d over d, we can divide force over deflection y to find an expression for the spring rate, scale of the spring, or spring constant k. And notice that I didn't take into account the parentheses since we're assuming that the spring index c will be higher than 4, and even in that case it would only be a 3% error. This value of k is that spring constant that you used back in physics. If c is a lower number, the suggestion would be to keep the parentheses as it would no longer be reasonably to consider it negligible. But in general, we do consider it negligible and use k as d to the fourth g over 8 d cubed n. The last thing we'll cover today is how the terminal end of compression springs affect this expression. If for example the last coil on both ends of a compression spring are squared or closed, which means that they are bent so that the full coil on the end is in contact with the surface that is compressing the spring, those two coils, one on each end, would not counteract or resist in any way the compression of the spring. Therefore, there is a difference between the total number of coils NT and the number of active coils NA, which are those that are actually twisting when the spring is compressed or stretched. So why not use only one variable capital N for the spring constant equation and refer to the active coils with it, since the expression only depends on the number of active coils? The answer is because we still have a use for the total number of coils NT. With the total number of coils, and depending on the terminal end shape of the spring, we can find what we call the solid length of the spring, which is the length of the spring when it's fully compressed and all coils are touching their adjacent coils. For example, for a squared or closed spring, the solid length would be the total number of coils times the wire diameter, plus one additional diameter, since that first coil or last coil, however you want to see it, would take up two diameters of height on its own when fully compressed and connected to a consecutive coil ring. The free length, on the other hand, is the length of the spring when it's not subjected to any loads. This length is usually stated in terms of the pitch, the distance between one coil and the next, and the number of active coils, since these are the coils that deform while the spring is compressed or stretched. Textbooks usually offer a table that sums up the different dimensions for different terminal end types, but they will not include all possibilities and it's always better to figure out those dimensions yourself. We will work on practicing this process with the examples covered in the Springs series videos. As mentioned before, we will cover the shearing yield strength calculations in the following video, which is the value we never want our spring stress to exceed when a spring is under operation. But for today's quick example, we'll use a maximum allowable shearing stress value of 130 ksi. If a helical compression spring has an outside coil diameter of 3 fourths of an inch, 10.5 total coils with squared ends, and is made with a 12 gauge Washburn and Moen wire size, what would the maximum allowed deflection be so that the spring doesn't fail? To do this, we know that the maximum deflection will be given by the maximum force before the stress reaches the value of the maximum shearing stress given to us, and the spring rate or spring constant k. Starting with the spring constant, I can look up the 12 gauge steel wire online to find that the shear modulus g is 11.5 times 10 to the 6 psi, and that the wire diameter for a 12 gauge is 0.1055. With this information, I can find the mean coil diameter capital D as the difference between the given outside coil diameter and the wire diameter. And finally, since we were told that the spring had squared ends, the number of active coils will be two fewer than the total number of coils. Substituting these values, I would find the spring constant of 78.3 pounds per inch.
Now, I know that the maximum shearing stress before the spring fails is when the shearing stress due to a compressive force reaches the value of the maximum allowable shearing stress. From this expression, I can solve for the maximum force, the force that causes that shearing stress. The only value I'm missing from this expression is the curvature correction factor Kb, which depends on the spring index C. With the known values for the mean coil diameter and the wire diameter, I can find C and therefore Kb, which allows me to calculate that maximum force. The maximum allowable deflection will therefore be the maximum allowable force so that the spring doesn't fail over the spring constant K. Additionally to this, we could calculate the solid length value, which depends on the number of coils and wire diameter, which we have, and select the pitch when manufacturing our spring so that the free length minus the solid length, which is the maximum possible physical deflection, is not greater than this deflection that we found. We would do this so that the compression is physically restricted so that the maximum allowable stress is never reached. If you want to watch other videos where more complex examples are solved using what we learned today, make sure to check out the links in the description below. In the next video, we will talk about the shearing yield strength, the nomenclature of materials we use for springs, and a brief mention on how to look for spring stability, specifically the buckling of springs, another common criterion for spring design and failure. Thanks for watching.